to talk about the second coming of the second Adam. That's a strange title, but that's what popped into my head. And I, I thought to myself, well, the second coming of the second Adam is really the first coming of the second Adam. And it is true. Christ came as the second Adam. Some people are amazed to find there are two Adams in the Bible, and they're quite a few years apart. And we're going to dis discover that today and look at that a little bit. And Father, we thank you for being with us as we lift our voices of praise to you. We pray that you'll speak to us through your word now and make it real. Holy Spirit, make it real to our understanding. And we do give you praise in the name of the Lord. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> Romans 5.19 will be our springboard to lead off with. As by one man's disobedience... As by one man's disobedience, that would be the first Adam, all became sinners. The whole race was rendered sinful. So by the obedience of one, the second Adam, shall many be made righteous. Today's message will give a contrast between the first Adam and the second Adam, and the true Christ and the false Christ. The first Adam was the first man, Genesis 2-7. The second Adam was Christ, the first and only God-man. How many are glad that we have a, another Adam? The first one sold us out. But the next one brought us back. Amen? Amen. The Apostle Paul speaks in 1 Corinthians 15, 45. As it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul, a human being. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Howbeit, that which was spiritual was not first, but was second. That which was first was natural, and then spiritual afterwards. The first man of the earth was earthly. As is earthly, verse 48, such are they also that are earthly. One translation says, those earth-minded are from the earth. Are you one of the earth-minded people? Well, we start out that way, but God wants us to be a different kind of a mindset. The nature of the earth-born man is shared by his earthly sons, Knox translation. The nature of the man made of dust is repeated in all men made of dust. And so if you think you're getting a little too prideful, just look at yourself in the mirror and you're dirt. <laughs> we, are, we are man of the dust. And is the heavenly, such are those that are heavenly. And verse 49, I love this, as we have borne the image of the earthly, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. The Apostle Paul says the first Adam became a living being, a living soul, and the second Adam became a living spirit or a quickening spirit. God breathed into Adam and he became a living soul. Christ came into us and he became a quickening spirit. Ephesians 2 1, you hath he quickened who were dead and trespasses in. How many are glad you've been resurrected to spiritual life through that second Adam? Christ is the first of those who will be raised from the dead, the first fruits from the dead. He is raised to eternal life because Christ rose from the dead. He is the life-giving spirit. He is not only the life-giving spirit, Jesus is the mighty baptizer in the spirit. The, the photograph that I put in our artwork reflects that this morning. 
He is the source of life and spiritual life. Just as the first Adam's human body was suitable for natural life, when believers are resurrected, God will give them transformed eternal bodies suited for eternal life. How many is looking for a new body as soon as possible? The more I get up in the morning, I know I need a new body, Jane. That's true. Uh, I know that you're probably better than I am, but it's true. That when believers are resurrected, God is going to give them a transformed eternal body suited for eternal life. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 15, 46, the natural came first and after that the spiritual. While it is true that Christ has existed from eternity past, he is called the second Adam because he came from heaven to earth many years after the first Adam. Christ came in a, as a human baby with a body like other humans. But he did not originate from the dust of the earth, no. As had the first Adam, the second Adam came from heaven. Amen. Don't you love this comparison? Paul says in Romans 5, 49, As we have borne the likeness of the first Adam, our earthly body, bodies suited for earth, we shall also bear the likeness or the image of the man from heaven, the second Adam. A body, listen to this now, a body imperishable, eternal, glorious, and filled with power. Man, I'm looking for that body. I need it as soon as possible. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. At this time, we are all like the first Adam. One day, all believers will be like Christ, the second Adam, who the Lord shall change our vile bodies, the resurrection, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body. Every saint is going to have a glorified body. I kind of think we're going to be at a perfect age in that glorified body. And I believe we're going to be in that real nice age bracket, you know, in that 30 bracket, you know. And I was so blessed last week. I was so blessed. So surprised. I, David, they, they made me speechless. And that's hard to do. They had a cake back there for my birthday, and it just floored me. I did not know this was happening at all. And I was really, really surprised about that. But uh, we do celebrate our birthdays from year after year. And I, I, it is a celebration because God has left us here for another day, for another year, that we may do his will and give glory to his name. Amen. And we want to do that. At this time, we are like Adam. All believers will be like Christ one day. These old vile bodies will be changed. The Apostle John actually writes about that. He says, as believers, we can know that our heavenly bodies will be just like Christ. He writes in 1 John 3, 2, Dear friends, I like the way he starts out, Dear friends, Dear friends, now we are the children of God, and what we will be has not yet been, well, totally realized. we not known yet, but we know. This almost sounds like a contradiction. Not known yet, but we know. Well, we haven't really experienced it yet, but we do know that when he appears, rapture, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And I put a little commentary there. Listen, you're going to have to have a glorified body with glorified eyes to be able to behold His glory. Come on. The Scripture separates humanity into two groups. Those are the first Adam, sinful man of the dust. Hosea 6 says they and they like Adam have transgressed the covenant or the agreement. They have broke faith with me. One translation puts it that way. But in Romans chapter 5, 12 through 21, gives us the greatest contrast and some of the best dialogue concerning the two Adams, the Adam, the first and the second. 
starting with verse 12 of chapter 5. I brought my different translations with me today because I love some of these renditions that I want to take time to give you today. I hear, when I was uh, probably 15 years in my ministry, somebody was selling a Bible, had 26 translations, and I have, that, it's coming apart. I have to hold it together. I've used it so much. But verse 12, Wherefore, as by one man's sin entered into the world, and death by sin, let me read another rendition of that. This, therefore, is like the case when though one man, Adam, sin entered into the world, and by sin came death. And one translation says, And so death passed upon all men, death spread to all mankind. Death pervaded the whole human race. And then he goes to verse 13. But sin is not imputed when there is no law. Or, But sin cannot be charged against a man where there is no law exists. Verse 14. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses. Sin held sway. Sin held sway over mankind. Philip's translation. I love that. And then he says, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression. In other words, he says, even though those who had not sinned as Adam had, in the face of an express command, even though we have not sinned the way he sinned, it's all passed on to us is what he is speaking of. But in verse 15, but he says... Who is the, verse 14 continuing, but who is the figure of him that was to come? The King James says, for who is the figure of him who was to come? Or another translation says, and Adam foreshadows that one to come. Adam, the first Adam, foreshadows the one that is to come. Adam, the first man, corresponds in some degree to the man who was to come, Philip's translation, but not as the offense is also the free gift. In other words, the free gift is much greater than the offense of the first Adam, but the gift is very different from the trespass of the first Adam. But God, out of his grace, is out of proportion to Adam's wrongdoing. In other words, God's free gift of this through this second Adam is so much greater than the transgression of the first Adam. For though for it through the offense of one many be dead, but by much more the grace of God and the gift by grace which is by one man Jesus Christ hath abounded unto many. I like this. Far more were the loving kindness of God, the gift given in loving kindness of the one man, Jesus Christ, the second Adam, lavished upon the whole race. I'm mean, glad that God's love and through the second Adam lavished his love upon the whole race. And it is not, verse 16, and, it, and not as if it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. No comparison, he says. And the effect of the gift of God was so much greater than the effect of the offense of Adam. One translation is, for the doom came out of the offense, a sentence of condemnation. But the gift comes out of the many offenses a sentence of acquittal. In other words, you've been acquitted. You were guilty. I mean, you were guilty of sin, but you've been acquitted. Does that sound good to anybody? For the doom came out of one offense, the doom and death of sin, a sentence of condemnation. How many knows there is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus? 
but the gift comes out of many offenses. A sentence of acquittal has been given. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ, the second Adam. One translation, Williams puts it this way, to, to a much greater degree will those who continue to receive the overflow of his unmerited favor and his gift of right standing with himself reign in real life through one Jesus Christ. Sin reigned, but Jesus Christ came and defeated and now he reigns in righteousness. Even so, by the righteousness of one of the free gift came upon all men unto the justification of life. I mean, here's the acquittal again. So also, the result of a single deed of righteousness is a life-giving acquittal for all mankind. Man, I'm going to tell you. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, but by the obedience of one, verse 19, many will be made righteous. I'm here glad for that. Verse 20, but the law came in only to expand and increase the trespass, making it more apparent that you're a sinner. When the law came, it amplified that you could not keep the law because the law was given so you couldn't keep the law to show you the offense and its power over you. But where grace abounds, where grace abounds, where sin abounds, grace did much more abound. And one, one translation says, but where sin abounded, the favor greatly of God superabounded. Sin abounded, but where the grace of God superabounded. It trumped it, in other words. Can you get that? And I like this. Yet through those sin is shown to be wide and deep. Thank God his grace is wide and deeper still. Can I read that again? Yet though sin is shown to be wide and deep. Thank God his grace is wider and deeper still. That's translation of verse 20 of chapter 5 of Romans. And then verse 21, that as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. And one translation of that says, now grace is the ruling factor. Now grace is the ruling factor with righteousness as its purpose bringing us eternal life. I read that again to you. Now grace is the ruling factor with righteousness as its purpose in bringing man into eternal life. Do you get that? I love that. Phraseology is beautiful of that verse. So on the back of your page, the first Adam, there was bondage to sin and death. To be in Christ, the second Adam, there is forgiveness, freedom, spiritual life, and victorious living. How many are glad you're in Christ? How many remember the old days when it wasn't so pleasant? And uh, Keith Green wrote a song because he came across some believers like in the Old Testament. So you want to go back to Egypt? I don't think so. Somehow they thought it was like, you know, let's go back to Egypt like it was St. Thomas, you know. Let's go lie on the beach. It was such a nice place. No, it was slavery. It was bondage. And so Keith Green writes this song. So you want to go back to Egypt? I don't think so. It's not the place you want to go back to. In Christ, the second Adam, there is forgiveness, freedom. You've been acquitted. Spiritual life and victorious living. 
to regain paradise for us. That includes us. Jesus had to become the second Adam because the first Adam failed us. In other words, Christ, the second Adam, had to come into likeness so he could succeed where the first Adam failed as our representative. Jesus went into the wilderness. He was actually led into the wilderness by Satan and was tempted by Satan just as the first Adam was tempted by the serpent in the garden. In Matthew 4, 1 through 11, we have the temptation of Christ. The difference was Jesus overcame Satan, setting the stage for Satan's final defeat on the cross. In Colossians 2, 13 through 15, Christ pardoned our sins. Verse 14, he utterly wiped out the damning evidence against you. I said he, he utterly wiped out the damning evidence that was against you. And then verse 15, he says, and he spoiled principalities and powers and made a show of them openly, triumphing over them. Come on. Man, the second Adam succeeded where the first Adam failed us. This is a great scripture. The greatest benefit that we receive from Jesus was victory over sin and death is his perfect righteousness, which he gave access, gives us access to heaven. Verse 2 Corinthians 5, 21, which is not listed there. For he, God the Father, has made righteousness of God in him. He made us who knew no sin, that he might make us, that he, listen, let me ask you a question. Can you be more righteous than God? Can you be righteous as God? Well, let's read this again. And I'll try not to mess it up this time. Okay, are you? For he, God the Father, for he, God the Father, has made him, Christ, the second Adam, to be sin for us. Who knew no sin that we, everybody circle we, or in your mind do it, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. If you'll go in the New Testament and circle every us, we, and you. Circle it in the New Testament. Circle everywhere it says us, we, and you. It will tell you who you are and what you have in Christ. If you'll just circle us, we, and you all through the New Testament, it tells you who you are and what you have in Christ. Now, can anybody be more righteous than God? Can you be righteous as God in Christ? That we might be made the righteousness of God in Him, in Christ. Somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. Come on. His victory enabled Him to help us. His victory enabled him to help us overcome in our daily lives. Look at Hebrews 2.18 I have for you. For in that he suffered being tempted, are able to succor or relieve or give immediate help to them who are tempted. Because he overcome, you can overcome. Because he's victorious, you can be victorious. Let's read this again. For in him that he suffered being tempted, able to relieve and give us immediate help to them who are tempted. Anybody here ever been tempted? Somebody said opportunity knocks once, temptation beats the door down. It's true. How many are glad that there is a second Adam? The first one failed us, the first man. But the second Adam, the God-man, came to rescue us and ch change our lives and bring us back to paradise lost. It was lost, but he came to rescue us and bring us back. 
Now, last week I talked about the second coming of Satan, and I want to finish today with Dr. Clarence Larkin gives us the following contrast between the true Christ and the false Christ. Christ came from above, John 6, and Christ will ascend from the pit. Christ came in his Father's name, John 15, and Christ will come in his own name. Christ humbled himself, Philippians 2, and Christ will exalt himself. Christ was despised, Isaiah says he was despised and rejected of men, remember? But Antichrist, on the other hand, will be admired. It's kind of like what we see happening today. The people that are, 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 are criminals, I mean, my gracious, it's amazing. People that are criminals, if they get shot, their family gets $5 million and they get trans transported to sainthood. It's amazing. And we, we admire people in, in the public life that are criminals. And Christ will be admired. Christ will be exalted, Philippians 2. And Christ will be cast down to hell. Christ came to do his Father's will. And Christ will come to do his own will, Daniel 11. Christ came to save, Luke 19.10. The Antichrist will come to destroy. Christ is the good shepherd, John 10. The Antichrist is the idle, evil shepherd, Zechariah 11. Christ is the true vine. I am the vine, says you are the branches. Abide in me and I'll abide in you. And we have abiding power by abiding in the vine. Amen. We sing that sometimes. Antichrist is the vine of the earth. Christ is the true vine. Christ is the truth, John 14. The Antichrist is the lie. Christ is the Holy One. The Antichrist is the lawless one. Christ is the man of sorrows. The Antichrist is the man of sin. Christ is the Son of God. The Antichrist is the son of perdition. I'm so glad for the second Adam and the true Christ that is with us today.